Hello, Sagnas. Good evening. I am delighted to be here, and um, I want to comment a little bit on uh, the uh, clip we just saw of a symphonic piece uh, called Wapango by Jose Pablo Moncayo. You notice the director, the conductor is uh, uh, Maestra Alondra de la Parra. Maestra de la Parra is a bright, brilliant Mexican woman who was born in New York City. She is, we saw her conducting the uh, Paris Symphony Orchestra, but she's currently the, the music director and the conductor of the Queensland Symphonic Orchestra in Brisbane, Australia. And she's also the cultural ambassador of Mexico. You're probably wondering, well, what does that all have to do with molecular machines, right? Well, one thing that to me is interesting and important is, of course, that I am very proud of my Mexican heritage. But I think the story of Maestra de la Parra also tells us that whether we, born, we were born in this country, we're second, third, or fourth generation, we were brought as kids, or we are immigrants, recent immigrants, we have so much to contribute to what goes on here and we all should be proud of our culture. The other thing, of course, that I want to talk about, I want to convince you that there is a correlation or a relation between music and molecular machines because they both rely on beautiful structures that are made possible by a large reduction of entropy. So let us explore that and see if I can persuade you today. If you think about it, music, uh, a, a musical piece really begins when we take sound waves that may actually, you know, maybe uncorrelated, could be somewhat random, but through some precise order, they actually uh, require some structure, right? In the case of Wapango, the elements of Wapango are actually the, the, the dance music of southeastern Mexico, which I really love. That structure, or those elements come together to form the structure of the musical piece by, by putting several pieces together. And now if you think about it, all of this, what is happening is that if you collect the noise of, or the sound from all the instruments in the orchestra, what you have is noise. And the conductor or the composer is selecting precisely those notes to make a musical piece. There is so much order, the reduction of entropy is amazing. We can see that in the score, right? It's also very interesting to point out that musicians and music lovers actually use a, a code, a symbolic language that actually represents the universe of sound waves that we can hear within the intensities that we can actually uh, understand. Can you see some similarities between, between what you see in the screen and chemistry and potentially molecular machines? Well, let us explore that a little. How about that? But before that, there is one important change. We have to change the orchestra, right? We need a diff different group of people engaged in this research. But once again, what we have is that we start with complex matter that we have to put order into so that we have a number of pure elements, simple molecules, and building blocks that then we organize further so that we have structures that have complex function. Like musicians, chemists have a symbolic language that looks a little bit complicated, but it it's also consists of lines and dots and, and arrows and, 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 and elements that we represent with those uh, particular letters and so on. And uh, if, when I create a new substance and I can put that in a schematic like the one I have in the screen, any chemist can actually read it, can execute the synthesis and get to the same properties that I uh, envision. The other thing is important is that the structure that we put in a piece of paper is evocative, right? Those structures tell us something about the properties of the molecule and tell us something about the motion, the dynamics of these molecules. And in some cases, it's dynamics what we're after. So in the case of molecular machines, what we're looking for is analogies between macroscopic objects and molecular objects. So we see that ex exemplified in the molecular gears and the macroscopic gears in the screen. There's one important thing, of course, to consider, and that is the fact that while molecular objects are ruled by Newtonian mechanics, and that's kind of illustrated on the, on, on the image on the left and the bottom, the reality is that molecules are actually, actually have to obey the laws of also statistical and quantum mechanics, which makes it a little bit more interesting. 
But really, again, how does structure, encoding information, and entropy play such a key role in the design and function of machinery? So what I thought is, let's take a look at a microscopic object. Let's take a look at, at, at a wristwatch. So let us say, you know, everything starts in nature, right? So we go to mines, oil fields, rocks, sand, and so on, and we purify uh, substances, we purify elements, and so on, and that's the first reduction of entropy. There is a, there's a large reduction of entropy when we go from the image on the left to the second image, where we have all these uh, uh, metals, and, metals and, and, and other things. Now, the next reduction of entropy is, is, takes the form of structure. Now we have to take those pure substances or simple substances and precisely craft each of those components so that now we're going to have uh, elements that play the role of gears, rotors, pushers, tiles, and so on. But we are not done yet. Now we're going to be measuring entropy by looking at the total number of objects that we have, the total number of pieces, and how they are arranged in space. Each spatial arrangement, we call it a configuration. And for as long as those pieces are not linked together, they can be moved in many different positions. That means that they can, can have many different configurations, perhaps thousands or millions, and that generates a very high entropy state. What happens then is that an expert watchmaker would come and put all those pieces one by one together in a way that all of a sudden they all become one, and they have only one type of motion where they, they're all uh, playing the role. We call that one degree of freedom. So you see there is a, a large reduction of entropy that goes on, and this image can actually be, can be uh, envisioned also at the molecular scale, except that now we start with starting materials, reagents, catalysts, and so on. We again follow a very precise plan where we increase complexity and reduce entropy at each step of the way. We can see the, the, the dynamics of the molecules, or we, 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 see, we see that encoded in the structure, we can, but we can also simulate it, as you can see in the screen. We can get the precise metrics with precision that is similar to what you would expect in something as sophisticated and a, as a watch and so on. Well, chemistry has evolved so much in recent time that, in fact, what you find is that chemists have, have been able to prepare molecular gears, molecular brakes, molecular rotors, receivers, and antennas, and there are many components and, and some relatively simple machines. In fact, many of you know are aware that last year, in 2016, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to Sauvage, Stoddard, and Feringa for the development of molecular machines. So we are in the brink of something very interesting and very exciting, and I think that's really one thing that motivates me a lot. We, we know how to build the elements. The, the challenge that remains, and I think that's a very interesting challenge, is going to the next stage. As you see, I've take, I have not taken the, 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 the watch from my image because that's the stage that we need to work on, the stage where we bring complexity. We, 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 we assemble many objects, and we have a complex function. So the next challenge is going to be the development of complex multimolecular assemblies. Now, this is a really interesting uh, problem that I think is actually, I find very exciting. So how do we go about doing that? Well, let us see. Let us think about that. What are we looking for? We're looking for something that has many molecules, many objects in high order, but we want them to have a certain level of motion. So you see that in this graph on the, on the, uh, on the vertical, we have increasing order which means low entropy, right? On the horizontal to the right, we have increasing motion. So when you, when, if you want to make a, a complex machine, you want order and motion. So we would like our molecular machine to populate the top right uh, corner of, of our diagram. So perhaps the first thing that we might want to say is, uh, uh, what does nature give us to address these particular challenges? So you, what you can do is go to the library or take a condensed uh, uh, matter physics course, and what you discover is the following. If you want order, you can get crystals, but crystals have very little motion. In fact, if you want motion, if you want things to be dynamic, you look for a liquid, right? We, we, most of us understand that. Nature also creates some so-called mesophases, the plastic crystals and all, uh, the liquid crystals, where there is an increase in molecular motion, but there is a decrease in order. Nature also provides us with glasses, which are solids that have 
neither order nor motion. It's kind of interesting, right? So that means that nature wants to solve, if you want to increase motion, nature wants to decrease the order. That's what nature gives us. So what that means is that we're going to have to invent something new. We're going to come up with something original, something different, something that populates that top right corner. And so the idea here has been that we need a structurally encoded motion and a structurally encoded order. And this is something that we call amphidynamic crystals. So that was sort of the idea. And then the question became, how do you make an amphidynamic crystal? What kind of molecule do you need? And the solution that we propose is emulating a macroscopic object, such as a, a, a gyroscope. Gyroscope is nice because it has a rigid component that is linked to a component that is highly mobile. And if you, if you try to think, what that might that look like if we have a, mol, a crystal or, or an, an array of uh, gyroscopes or compasses if we put a dipole uh, 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 positive and negative charges. And you see the image on the, on the right that has a collection of compasses. And I have an image, a, a magnet in the back that moves around just to illustrate that there is a way for us from the macroscopic world to interface and interact with molecules or groups of molecules. To envision that object, what you can see is here. So we have prepared a significant number of crystalline materials, a significant number of amphidynamic crystals that have the properties that this, this uh, uh, particular image conveys. They have crystalline order, and they have order motion. And we can actually detect that motion by a, by a large number of, uh, of uh, techniques, including taking advantage of electric fields, magnetic fields, X-ray diffraction, and other. So what you think is that I think we're onto something, and, and I think this is something where many of you can contribute if you're interested in chemistry and molecular machinery. We can design complex objects that have, have a structurally encoded motion, a structurally encoded order. They're crystalline, and they have very low entropy. If I take that image in, on, on the screen and I follow the motion of some of these uh, particular components, what I find is a molecular dynamic simulation that looks something like that. So that plot indicates how the motion of the different groups are. And I don't know if it reminds you of something that I showed you at the very beginning, right? So this looks like noise. But what if I could come with a stimulus and control that, mo that noise and create music at the molecular scale, right? Perhaps if, if we bring some input, we can encode and transduce something like music by taking advantage of the motion of atoms, which of course happens at a different scale, so it'll have to be transduced in an effective way. With this, I think I will stop, but I want to really uh, impress on you the fact that uh, like music, like a symphonic uh, piece, science requires a collaboration of many, many talented as people, scientists like yourselves, and, and there really are many opportunities, and I think uh, all of us in, in the Sagnas community have an important play to role. So I invite you to participate in science like this. And muchísimas gracias, Sagnas. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you.